From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at 530, streaming now. Now at 530, a kidnapping scam real enough to scare the life out of any parent. The chilling details about a scam many people are falling for. Lindsay. At the top of our lineup today, Thanksgiving break is almost here, which could bring new risks when it comes to college students. What experts say will keep them from bringing the coronavirus home. We could be facing unemployment benefits, eviction protections, and student loan deferments all ending at the same time. What's being done to help hold off this disastrous situation? An interest in the social media website Parlor is surging. Who's signing up and the impact it could have? Now first at 530, police across the country are warning about a phone scam where they claim your son or daughter has been kidnapped. Consumer reporter John Matteris has an important warning so you don't waste your money. As if we didn't have enough to worry about during this pandemic, police are warning about a terrifying phone scam, which one mom told me was the most frightening call she's ever received. Natalie Bruiser was heading home from work when her cell phone rang. I answered and it was a uh one of the kids crying and I could not figure out who it was. It sounded like her 20 something daughter, Nicole. They were apologizing and they were just crying super hard. And so I was hysterical. Who said she had been kidnapped. And a black suburban had pulled up and people got out with guns and Nicole started screaming. A man then got on and said if she wanted to see her daughter again, she needed to get money and stop at this gas station. The man said police were on their tail and that she needed to act quickly or they would harm her daughter was crying heavily and I'd say Nicole just please calm down I need to hear your voice I need to really hear and make sure you're okay but it was all a scam there was no black SUV at this gas station there were no police cars in pursuit and as for Natalie's daughter she was home resting I'm freaking out at this point. I don't know if they have her hostage or not, you know. So the plea, the Springboro police actually went there and banged on her door and she was sleeping. And so here she was safe at home. It's called the virtual kidnapping scam. Police say the caller is not local and doesn't even know your son or daughter's name. Be suspicious of any strange phone call that appears to be from your child. It could happen to anybody and it was so real. If you get a call like this, call police and call home, no matter what they tell you. So always don't waste your money. I'm John Matteris, WRTV. I think you would agree it's feeling a lot more like November. If you parked outside this morning, your car was out, you had to do a lot of scraping, and then lots of frost covering the ground to begin our day. Sunshine started to melt that away, and we've got a nice sunset in progress across central Indiana. Temperatures, they're in the low 50s. We'll take it. We had to work hard to get there. Temperatures 48 in Greenwood, 49 in New Pal. Temperature also in Fisher's Geist area at 49 degrees. It won't be as cold tonight. We drop into the middle to upper 30s, 44 by noon tomorrow. Afternoon temperatures to the north stay in the mid 40s. You can see what happens. We don't warm up a whole lot. Plan on maybe 50 for the high on your Friday. Biden is hoping for more wins in two Senate runoff races in Georgia. Armaya Rodriguez is in Atlanta, where people know they're in for a politically bumpy couple of months. For more than six decades, Manuel's Tavern has been the spot in Atlanta. Quintessential political bar. For people who love politics. Every election, we've, we've been here. People like Angelo Fuster, who knew the original owner, Manuel Malouf, who himself got into politics decades ago. It is a place that a lot of people sort of gravitate to. And folks will be there again on January 5th because the nation's political attention is now zeroing in on Georgia, where the fate of the U.S. Senate hangs in the balance. Georgia isn't exactly used to this attention. It's been a reliably Republican stronghold for decades. But in 2020, it's the last of the battleground states, with the final two U.S. Senate races held in this election cycle. In one race, incumbent Republican 
Republican Senator David Perdue faces Democratic challenger John Ossoff. And in the second race, incumbent Republican Senator Kelly Leffler faces Democratic challenger Raphael Warnock. For all those Georgians who are tired of the campaign ads, of their mailboxes being flooded with advertisements from campaigns as well, get used to it. Bernard Fraga is an associate professor of political science at Emory University in Atlanta. We're going to have another two months of both sides, the Democratic and Republican candidates, but also the national parties, nonprofit organizations, mobilization groups, working their hardest to make sure that their campaigns win and that voters are active and engaged. It's gonna be bananas. Craig Eberhardt is with Men of Higher Standards, a nonpartisan African-American men's group focusing on voter registration in Georgia, where people can still register through the first week of December. The group shared these photos with us of some of their voter registration Registration efforts from prior to the November election. For the forthcoming future, Georgia is going to be one of those states that you can't take for granted. You don't have in your back pocket. You're going to have to work to get the vote of the people in Georgia. Back at Manuel's Tavern. We don't have a real good record of turning out for runoffs. Angelo Fuster wonders if this time might be different. I think that there's that energy. Because the sun hasn't set on the 2020 elections quite yet. In Atlanta, I'm Maya Rodriguez. Next in our lineup, there are concerns that college students coming home for Thanksgiving could spread COVID. Experts explain the most effective way to prevent this. From memory loss to headaches, researchers at UC San Diego are starting to get a better understanding of a frightening side effect to coronavirus, long-term brain problems. Jared Ahrens from our script station in San Diego takes an in-depth look at the issue. And what's being done to help? I thought that I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm active. If I get it, I'll be asymptomatic. When Danica Shaver got coronavirus in September, she didn't expect it to be so severe. Every symptom hit me like a train. From pain to fatigue and then brain issues. Headaches started to kick in, which turned into migraines. And I actually did have a couple of days where it felt like I just had a fog over the front of my forehead. And then the forgetfulness started when I went back to work. Danica's story is common. According to doctors at UC San Diego, 30% of all coronavirus patients report some type of neurological issue. That number rises to 80% among patients in the ICU. And for any patient who was in the hospital, 30% of them reported memory or concentration problems as late as three months after the infection ends. Uh, stroke, brain hemorrhages, autoimmune reactions to COVID, also a lot of confusion and delirium. Doctors at UC San Diego have been studying the issue for months, the start of a 10-year research program. They've already found several reasons COVID affects the brain. It could be from cerebral spinal fluid infections. Inflammation to blood vessel linings could cause hemorrhages, clotting, even strokes or a coma. And heart and lung damage can lead to low oxygen levels in the brain. The disease can also cause psychological damage like PTSD or depression. But we also know the overall stress, the systemic stress, the psychiatric stress of going through uh, this disease or possibly being admitted to an ICU with this disease or going through an entire outbreak in your family with this disease can lead to some neuropsychiatric symptoms as well. Shaver is now part of the study. Her neurological symptoms still haven't gone away. I've never been forgetful and this brain fog, this forgetfulness is kind of irritating because I'm not used to it. She and the doctors at UC San Diego Hope they'll find answers soon. It's so important for people to know that if they experience symptoms, there is help out there and they need just to seek it out. That was Jaron Aaron's reporting. If you are experiencing any of these neurological issues, such as headaches or memory loss, call your doctor. This week, the CDC put out updated recommendations for celebrating Thanksgiving amid the pandemic. The agency says virtual gatherings or just gatherings with members of your own household are your safest options. In-person gatherings with people outside your home, including students returning home from college, are higher risk choices. With this in mind, colleges are trying different approaches to keep families safe and prevent COVID-19 spreading in communities. 
some colleges like Boston University have asked students to stay on campus rather than travel home. But I'd say that the most of most of the colleges have not done that. And any college uh, that's having a lot of students leave campus and go home uh, really needs to have a serious plan in place for pre-departure quarantine and testing for the students. He says the ideal situation is having students quarantine for at least a week before they travel home and then have a very aggressive testing plan in place. He says the University of Illinois is the school that people are watching closely and believe it may be a model for other colleges. They're asking students to only be doing essential activities in these two weeks before the holiday. Because we have testing availability on campus, we can allow our students to test twice in the week before they go home and if they self quarantine in between those two tests and they have two negative tests, they can be fairly confident that they are non infectious when they go to their families. New York's public university system is also requiring all students to test negative for COVID before they can leave for Thanksgiving. All classes at the University of Illinois will be virtual after Thanksgiving. They say if students need to come back, they'll have to get tested every other day and self quarantine for the rest of the semester. Other schools are taking the approach of going virtual after Thanksgiving as well. Ahead in our lineup, there are concerns about extra benefits and protections all ending at the same time. The help that may be available without a new stimulus package. With no new stimulus bill, many Americans are approaching a financial cliff. Their unemployment benefits are about to run out, eviction moratoriums are about to expire, and student loan relief will end. Alicia Nieves shows us potential relief some could get even if Congress remains at deadlock on a stimulus bill. <laughs> Jeff Catanese is a theater director, actor, and drama teacher who lost all three of his jobs in March. That hit me especially hard. He has since found temporary work here and there, but has mostly relied on unemployment to survive. In about two weeks, I will no longer have any funding. That's because during the pandemic, unemployment has been capped at 39 weeks. So how I get through the winter, I'm actually not sure. There is a part of me that is very worried. However, um, one thing that is stealing me a little bit is that there are people that I know personally who are a lot worse off than me. We are getting letters all the time from people who are living in parks, are living in their cars. Stephanie Freed is the co-founder of the advocacy group ExtendPUA.org. It shows people how to share their unemployment stories and struggles with members of Congress in hopes of pushing them to extend PUA benefits. Freed is also someone who lost her job in March and is about to run out of her unemployment benefits in a week. I will lose my apartment, um, but I, I have people I can stay with. I can go stay with my parents, even though I'm in my 30s, which does not feel great, but I won't be homeless. Um, but millions of people will. Jeff Catanese, Stephanie Freed, and even her Extend PUA co-founder, Grant McDonald, are just three of an estimated 13 million Americans who will run out of unemployment benefits by the end of the year. And they will do so when federal eviction moratoriums lapse and student loan relief ends. It's a pretty dire situation. Elizabeth Pancotti is with Employed America and explains even without congressional action, there may be help for some. After PUA and PEUC end on December 26, um, some of those workers will be eligible to flow on another federal program called the Extended Benefits Program, and that's for states where unemployment is high within the state, and so you'd get an additional 6 to 20 weeks. The Extended Benefits Program only gets triggered in January, and so far only people living in these 15 states and D.C. are expected to qualify. I'm Alicia Nieves reporting. WRTV is getting ready for the holiday season. Our 20th annual toy drive kicks off Saturday at Christmas Nights of Lights at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. The holiday display is a drive through format. One dollar for every ticket sold on Saturday will go to the WRTV toy drive. You'll be out there with a preview tomorrow night, right, Kevin? And is Miss Rory coming with you, too? No Rory. So it will be a quiet experience, except for the lights are synchronized to music. There are a million lights. So I've been broadcasting from home since March, except for on severe weather days. Rory Gregory rarely makes an appearance here in the basement, but she showed up last night and then she dropped by uh, this evening. So 
I don't know. She's getting comfortable with this idea. 51, that's the current temperature in Indy. We had 53 for the actual high temperature. We're headed into the 30s tonight, but instead of the low 30s, it will be a little warmer. There's your cool pattern. What a beautiful day tomorrow. As Amanda mentioned, I will be live during the 5, 5, 36, and 7 o'clock shows. We'll give you a little preview of the Christmas Nights of Lights out at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. Big night for the toy drive Saturday. A dollar from each car will go to benefit families in need through the toy drive. Temperature Sunday peak in the morning, and then we fall from there. Your headlines tomorrow, lots of sunshine. Temperatures in the upper 40s, but a cold northwest wind. By noon, we're at 44. Temperatures peak in that 3 to 4 o'clock hour. Then we've got our showers for the weekend. Later in the day, Saturday, and then I'd say Saturday night into Sunday morning is the wettest stretch. We may have some thunderstorms Saturday night, and we'll have strong winds for sure Saturday night through much of Sunday. A man who battled COVID-19 for weeks has a unique way to remember the frontline workers who saved his life. John Rathbun made a list of every nurse that came into his room. And by the end of his stay at the hospital, that list had 66 names. And he has a story about each of them. Tanya was the one who gave me ice cream to make the insure go down a little bit easier. Summer, uh, it was a respiratory therapist who on the night of 725 figured out that I had the wrong mask and uh, and she went and got me a new one and it just made all the difference in the world. Rathbun is now recovering at home. He has plans to say thank you in person to some of the nurses who took care of him. Overdose deaths in the U.S. are on track to reach an all-time high this year. Some states had more deaths in nine months than all of last year. Dan Grossman takes a look at how the pandemic may have fueled the rise. When looking at what takes place in Dr. Jim Caruso's world, we're busier than we've ever been. There is little we can add to what the stacks of paper on his desk already say. For overdoses, we exceeded all of last year's totals uh, prior to the beginning of October. Every day, he examines bodies, filling out death reports as the coroner for the city and county of Denver. We have been ringing the fentanyl bell for several months now. And every day, more of those bodies come back with the same cause of death. We have had fentanyl-related deaths in individuals as young as nine years old. Kids are always tough, and they've been tough for me my whole career because you're looking at the most lost years of productive life. Here in this city, the numbers match what so many other cities are seeing. By the end of last month, 260 people died from overdose, a number that already far exceeds the 225 that died in all of last year. And the story is similar in states such as Florida, Michigan, and Kentucky, to name just a few. Drug overdoses uh, are exceeding every metric that we've seen for the past decade. Across the country, more than 74,000 overdose deaths have been reported this year, up from 68,000 last year. Even more striking is how much fentanyl, a drug that has been trafficked more by the cartel during the pandemic, has contributed to those totals. In the early part of the year, we've seen an increase of about 13 percent. Dr. Ken Leonard is the director of the Research Institute on Addictions at the University of Buffalo and says since the start of the pandemic, overdose deaths have only increased at a faster rate, particularly among those with existing drug issues. The pandemic and the isolation for a lot of people, the unemployment, um, that creates a tremendous amount of stress. It shut down treatment centers, isolated people from their support networks, and left people bored and stressed as deaths in nearly every state peaked in either April or May, just after the tightest stages of quarantine began. When you, somebody in their teens you know, dies, uh, it, it certainly uh, uh, probably hits, especially parents uh, who are doing my job uh, a little bit harder. Because it takes months to tabulate national overdose death numbers, the true extent of what is happening may not be known until next year. We're in new territory as far as overdoses go. Despite early indicators that we're already in the midst of an unprecedented drug epidemic taking place during this unprecedented pandemic. I'm Dan Grossman reporting. But I don't think that's right for them to censor what I am trying to learn more about. There's a wave of people moving to alternative social media sites that are less strict on content. Still to come in our lineup, what communication experts think about possible repercussions. So we're finding we're finding ways around this censorship. 
And that is my underlying reason for exiting to parlor. Dana Callahan is one of millions of new users to a social media website called Parlor. The mother and small business owner recently noticed more of her networking circle joining Parlor. So she says she decided to join after being put in what she calls Facebook jail three times and because of blocked content. Parlor's community guidelines are a lot less strict. Education. Education is the path to power, knowledge, and success. And you can't be educated if they limit what your options are. And if the goal is to find somewhere that's not going to censor you, it's probably not going to censor anyone else, however offensive or dangerous what they say is. Josh Pasek is an associate professor of communication, media, and political science. He says major social networking platforms have realized they have to play a role in determining how much certain speech gets spread because it could be dangerous or inaccurate. Pasek says sites like Parler could turn out to be a place that only attract certain groups, but if larger communities move, you could have a more se segmented society. We've already seen some of the problems that can occur because of that. Shifts in the media environment where conservatives in particular are attending to a fairly different media ecosystem um, than either people in the center or people on the left, um, have really made for some challenges in adjudicating fact. Um, and that is quite problematic. Some of the recent wave of people leaving traditional social media is attributed to differences in political beliefs. Sites like Parler, MeWe, and Gab are seen as more of an alternative for conservatives. We need to figure out as a society how it is that we're going to ensure that people are operating off of quality information. Choice is the foundation of what I feel makes the United States strong. We've got to have that freedom to see all options, the good, the bad, the ugly, the scary, to make our own personal decision on where we stand. Some doctors who perform weight loss surgery say they've seen a significant jump in prospective patients interested in the procedures. Tomorrow, how doctors say the rise is less about image and more about survival during the pandemic. Clouds slip back into central Indiana tonight. We'll call it partly cloudy overall. Temperatures, they'll be above the freezing mark, a little bit warmer than we were this morning when we had that frosty start. We'll talk more about the weekend and the big changes there as well in the next half hour.